All right, thank you very much for having me. It's a great honor for me to present this keynote. Uh, I'm gonna briefly describe a um, research program that aims to formulate a unified theory of asset prices and uh, um, macro dynamics. I've been pursuing this line of work since 2010, 2011. Uh, so I have four papers to show for, and this line of work only starts to bear fruit in the past uh, three years or so. All right, so in, back in 2012, when a bunch of us got together and uh, founded the Macro Finance Society, at the time, macro finance was pretty much an oxymoron. And the reason for this um, separation between macroeconomics and the surprising is really due to the Marion Prescott equity premium uh, paper. So because it's so darn difficult uh, to explain equity premium uh, in a DSG production economy. So most of the time, so in a surprising literature, so we just work with the endowment economies in which cash flows are exogenously specified. So we have uh, external habit model, loan and risk model, as well as the more recent disastrous models. And um, on the other hand, in a, in a production economy, um, uh, Roman Haas was the first paper that tackles the equity premium problem, uh, but uh, he shows that, look, so consumption risks endogenously are just so tiny uh, because of uh, consum powerful consumption smoothing uh, mechanism due to capital investment. Um, uh, more recently, uh, uh, Tararini has a nice paper, 2000 at the GME, uh, that shows a separation um, result uh, in, a, in a production economy, general equilibrium, uh, Tom shows that you can, with recursive preference, Tom shows that you can increase a risk aversion as much as you want to explain, to match the sharp ratio, not equity premium or stock market volatility, just sharp ratio, uh, while at the same time retaining reasonable macro quantities because macro quantities are mostly pinned down by the intertemporal elasticity of substitution. So a kind of separation result holds in which asset prices um, are mostly determined by risk aversion, whereas quantity dynamics are mostly determined uh, by the EIS. And the, and the macroeconomists uh, love these results and have been, uh, this, um, have, been, have, been, have been so far largely ignored um, um, asset prices. Um, uh, the reason is that, look, uh, people argue you can just look at um, the separation result by by, by saying, you know, equity premium is important, but let's leave that uh, for later, or let's just build the DSGE for quantities first. So over the, pa over the past few decades, the DSGE research program has come a long way and from starting from Kitten Prescott, Law and Prosser in early 80s and all the way to the more recent uh, New Keynesian DSGE model, Cristiano by Cristiano Eichenbaum Evans and the Smash and Wilders. So the financial uh, crisis really put everything uh, kind of um, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in a self-reflection uh, mode. And I have, I have here an article by first page of the article by Paul Krugman on uh, New York Times, uh, how did economists get it so wrong? So Paul basically uh, raised a whole bunch of criticisms on the mainstream, mainstream DSGE modeling. Uh, now, I do not agree with Paul on many issues, but I find his writing very, very stimulating, quite interesting, and the insightful that uh, uh, can, can help one uh, focus in terms of uh, research program, research ideas. So among the many criticisms that uh, Paul and many others have uh, raised against the DSG modeling, so I took away uh, three criticisms that I feel uh, that are more important, and more importantly, I feel that we can do something about them um, and uh, while leave many others, other questions to other people. So the thing that uh, that strikes me the most is, is that the localized dynamics, by which I mean the most of the DSGE models, right? So when you have medium scale or large scale DSGE models, but you don't solve the whole nonlinear dynamics. So you do lower order uh, first order or second order perturbation methods on deterministic steady states. 
So basically, we're looking at the normal times. We only analyze normal times, right? So if the, if the economy uh, wanders a bit further away from deterministic steady state, for example, there's like a bigger shock, like the COVID shock, uh, for example, and then, and then all the second order, uh, higher order perturbation, the higher order terms are gonna suffer quite a bit on accuracy. Okay, so it's it's quite important in my view to to analyze nonlinear model on a truly globally nonlinear uh, algorithm. So Paul also mentioned that also also raised the problem that uh, so so macro has nothing has very little to do with finance and, uh, and Paul actually wants us to embrace behavioral finance that may well be the truth going forward but we're not going to go there just yet. And the bottom line is that I interpret the critique as saying, look, uh, it's about time that we take uh, equity premium. At the, at the minimum, we need to have a risk with some sense of risk premiums in our DSG models, because you cannot just ignore a such important issue on equity premium uh, for so long, for decades, right? So it, somehow macro and the finance have to come together. Um, and and, and that, that's actually the key motivation for, 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 for this research program. So Paul also talked about the little room uh, for policies and that, that was true for the, literally true in the, in, the, in the first generation DSGE models because in the stochastic growth model, uh, without a whole lot of frictions, uh, competitive equilibrium is pretty optimal. So if business cycles are optimal solution and there's very little room for government to, 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 to screw it up, right? And well, the policies will make things worse. That, that was the philosophical starting point. And that's not uh, true in the more recent uh, new Keynesian DSG models. So you can talk a lot about uh, uh, monetary physical policies. So on the other hand, so we know from Lucas uh, 1987 welfare cost calculation. So uh, without equity premium, the, the, welfare, the welfare cost for business cycle is just so low. So the room for policies to improve things uh, is not that spacious <laughs> in the sense that we can clearly see what economics stands right now in the academic literature and how policymakers behave in reality. So, and that, that the gap must be filled somehow. And, and I would say it's the problem for the economic literature as opposed to what the policymakers are doing in practice. All right, so our long-term goal is really to formulate a unified theory of asset prices and business cycles. They are really, you can ask many classic questions and important questions all over again, and you can redo everything. Um, and potentially change a lot of the current results in the existing literature. Uh, but so far we have provided the uh, answers that we feel comfortable with uh, for three questions. First of all, what are the micro foundations for the exogenously specified, often quite complicated cash flow dynamics in uh, consumption-based asset pricing models? All right, the, 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 the thinking that the thinking is that as long as the cash flow dynamics are consistent with the production side, we are free to specify uh, cash flow dynamics in any way uh, you want. But on the other hand, based on our experience, the production side actually imposes quite a bit of uh, restrictions for how the indulgence for the how, how the cash flow dynamics would behave in an indulgence way, right? So that's uh, that's that's an important issue we want to shed some light on. And the second question is that um, uh, whether or to what extent uh, time-bearing risk premiums will matter quantitatively for macroeconomic dynamics. And this question seems pretty kind of borne out during the um, 2007 to 9 to 09 uh, financial crisis. But, uh, but again, from the perspective of current economic literature and in finance as well, so we have very little um, uh, prior work uh, that tackles this question. So, and finally, as alluded earlier, how large is welfare cost of business cycles in a, in a, in a, in a model, in a DSGE model with reasonable equity premium? All right, so there are many, there are many, many um, challenges 
that uh, that um, that the phase uh, unified the model. Okay, and in many authors have talked about this uh, different aspects of the challenges, uh, but I'm just going to highlight one uh, that uh, that uh, elaborated, articulated extremely well by Countdown Brunner Lockstar, a 2010 RFS paper. So, what's the key challenge? for the equity premium in production economies. Why is so darn difficult, much more difficult in production economy uh, than in an endowment economy? So this is why. So we know that um, dividends equal profits minus investment and profits equal output minus wages, okay? When the labor market is frictionless, wages equal marginal product of labor and with Cobb Douglas, marginal product of labor is proportional to output. In other words, marginal product of labor is as procyclical as output. That means that profits, if wages are pro proportional to output, that means profits are proportional as well. That means profits are no more procyclical than output. Yeah. So however, because of consumption smoothing, we know investment is more procyclical. Uh, their output, right? Because our uh, utility function is concave, so the expected uh, uh, utility is going to be higher if we can if we can uh, remove if we can reduce consumption volatility. And then, however, because investment enters dividends with a negative sign, so profits are as procyclical as output, but the investment is more procyclical, and that that means that dividends must be tend to be. Uh, counter cyclical and in other words stock market is a hedge and this is why it's so hard uh, to generate any kicks any source of risk uh, for the stock market in an endowment economy so this is why we need to we feel like we need to uh, go beyond the stochastic growth model and that's how we entered um, um, uh, the diamond models and piece of readers, uh, macro labor literature uh, to deal with the search model of equilibrium unemployment. And it turns out the search model turns dividends pro cyclical, right? So dividends in the search model equal profits minus investment minus vacancy costs. By the way, wages are labor expenses. They are current period expenses. They are expensed away from current period earnings in accounting. And only vacancy costs uh, deliver future payoffs. So they meet the accounting definition of assets. Okay, So only vacancy costs uh, should be considered as investment in workers. So with search frictions, more importantly, with search frictions, dividends are detached and no longer proportional uh, to output that yeah, because wages are detached from uh, uh, they're still linked but they're not as much tied with the marginal product of labor anymore in particular wages are inertial okay and this uh, you can see that uh, even with the textbook version of the Nash wages which we uh, have mostly relied on so in other words as a result profits become more procyclical than output Okay, because uh, because of wages provide operating leverage, profits are going to become more procyclical than output. Now, because of consumption smoothing, investment of vacancy costs are going to continue to be more procyclical than output. But that's okay because profits are even more procyclical. As a result, the procyclicality of profits is sufficient to overpower the procyclicality of investment vacancy costs. As a result dividend becomes procyclical, and this is the source our, of our endogenous risk for cash flows in a DSG uh, uh, production economy. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe, um, with that short introduction out of the way, I'm going to describe three papers um, uh, briefly, endogenous disasters, and then I'm going to talk about the uh, projection method globally nonlinear. And the one reason it took a long while, multiple years, for this line of work to start to bear fruits is because we we, we have to we have to we have to build up a whole set of machinery uh, for the computational algorithm. And finally, so I'm going to pull everything together and put the unified model together for asset prices and business cycles and business cycles. So this is our 2018 AER paper. So we show in this paper that textbook Diamond Mortensen and Pizzeridis model of equilibrium unemployment gives rise endogenously to economic disasters. Okay, so what's the intuition? 
So I'm going to call this a causal mechanism. So I've been recently started to explore philosophy of science literature. It turns out comparative statics are causal. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to call the call the intuition more causal mechanism now. It's definitely causal within the model, and by induction, I'm going to argue it's the same causal mechanism in reality as well. So and I already mentioned the first channel, which is based on wage inertia because wages are detached from marginal product of labor. Another important channel that we highlight in our endogenous disasters paper is the downward rigidity of marginal hiring costs. So, so I've been working with the newer classical Q theory of investment all my career. So one distinctive feature of the search model from the investment model is that in the investment model, when firms do not invest or disinvest, if I just sit here to wait and do nothing, my marginal costs of investment are gonna be zero. But that's not the case in the labor market because imagine your department goes on AFA uh, and do hire rookies uh, year after year. And uh, you know, right after Thanksgiving, you're gonna receive packets, all the packets are gonna arrive and you're gonna review all the packets. And then you have faculty meeting, you debate among your colleagues and trying to figure out who to invite. Uh, to the AFA interviews and then you come back and come back to town, you debate again with your colleagues to figure out the, uh, the fly out the list and then you one and dine with the candidates and the half an hour meeting and seminars and all. So months of uh, time spent and then you have another meeting and debate who to give offers to. And then the, after all this, the candidates are gonna tell you, uh, thank you very much. We really enjoyed our uh, campus visit, but uh, I'm gonna go, uh, go to your competitors. So, so you pay the same amount of uh, hiring costs, but, uh, but uh, you, you, you it's not inconceivable you're gonna end up with nobody. In other words, even if you hire no one, you pay the same amount of uh, marginal hiring costs. Now, let me put the wage inertia and the uh, downward rigidity of marginal hiring costs together. So in a, so imagine in a recession, you have a, a, a big negative shock on your productivity. So because of wage inertia, your profits are gonna drop quite a bit. At the same time, your marginal hiring costs remain relatively high. So at one point, firms are gonna say, forget about it, hiring freeze, we're not gonna hire anybody. And then that's when you see the aggregate employment uh, tumbles down cumulatively 10%, for example, and that's Barrow Wusswa's uh, definition of economic disaster. So that's the basic intuition. All right, let me, let me show you a, uh, give a little bit uh, uh, texture to the story. So this is our model, very, very, very high, high level uh, description. So a representative firm gonna post job vacancies to attract unemployed workers, and that's the matching function. So, and here is the unit cost of vacancy posting and the marginal cost, marginal cost of hiring is given by the following term. And this is what's important. And this Q, T, Q of theta, T, Q is the, um, um, Q is the vacancy uh, filling rate. This is the probability of you fill a given vacancy, right? And in a recession, Q goes to one because uh, you don't have a whole lot of competitors if you are firm, while as a lot of unemployed workers, so Q goes to one. But even when Q goes to one, the marginal cost of hiring, you're gonna hit down with the floor, kappa zero plus kappa one the marginal costs do not go to zero, okay? Why, so that's one, that's one dimension of a nonlinearity. Another dimension is that in good times, when everybody's hiring, you're gonna be competing with your uh, other companies that uh, for the same pool of candidates. So, so Q goes down, the probability of you uh, feel a given slot uh, goes to zero. So that's when the marginal cost of hiring uh, goes up. Um, at the increasing speed. This is why in this model, recessions are pretty fast and furious, whereas booms are more gradual, okay? Because firms face um, a convex costs of marginal cost of hiring. Right, so employment accumulation, uh, quite a standard production function, constant return to scale uh, with the labor as the only productive input and uh, labor pro productivity follows the standard AR1. And as dividends, uh, right, and the stochastic discount factor by basically using a uh, log utility. I probably should mention that the way had the intuition 
that I presented earlier about the pro-cyclical versus counter-cyclical dividends for a long time, since like 2011. Uh, but it took a long while. So we were aiming at the equity premium puzzle, even in the uh, AER paper, but we, we, we couldn't close the deal. We couldn't solve the model uh, with capital and the recursive utility actually actually solved the simpler version of that uh, with Cobb Douglas production function, uh, but equity premium was so low. So after being stuck for, for a while, the first major revision took us two years and eight months. And then we had to do something that we are not very good at, which is to compromise. And the compromise is to emphasize the endogenous disasters point uh, with, the, with, the, with the lock utility. Oh, well. So our wages are from Nash bargaining uh, process, a fairly standard a textbook model. The basic idea is that if I'm, if I'm more productive, I'm going to earn more. If I'm more popular on the labor market, for example, if I, you know, if a, if a worker has multiple outside offers, so it's going to be quite costly for your home institution to replace you, and then you're going to earn more as well. And finally, if I can just stay at home and get a whole lot of uh, government uh, payment uh, as unemployment insurance, in other words, if I, my flow value of unemployment activity is high, I'm going to the, my employer has to pay me more as well. So bottom line is that if ADA, so bottom line is that wages are not, are no longer proportional to, to output. Okay, if anything, um, so when ADA is calibrated to be small, which is our calibration, so wages are gonna be relatively less sensitive to productivity. And when, 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 when uh, uh, especially when the flow value of uh, employment is relatively high, wage is gonna be tied up with a bigger chunk, chunk of constant churn, right? And that's our calibration. And we are using a low workers bargaining weight, ADA being 4%. And the back flow value of unemployment is 0.85. And we follow Hector Manoski paper uh, in spirit. And then we calibrate the condition of volatility of uh, labor product productivity to hit the consumption volatility of the barrel Wusua uh, cross country panel. And uh, here is the results uh, cumulative empirical cumulative distribution function on employment and uh, and the output. So most of the time, the economy hovers around the 6.3% average unemployment rate, uh, but uh, with small probability, unemployment uh, spikes up big time drastically. And correspondingly, for output, most of the time, it stays around the medium. With small probability, economy can just simply fall, force off a cliff in a very fast and furious. And that's the uh, nonlinear dynamics that we're writing on. So in terms of uh, quantitative results, disaster moments, we're simulating the, um, the search economy for 10,000 times. And we, for, on, on each panel, we implement the, the exact the same barrel USWA peak to trial measurement on disaster moments. Uh, we get quite close. So 5% disaster probability in the model. Disaster size is also quite comparable. And so is duration, I should mention. Consumption disaster probability is quite a bit lower than that in the data. And there are some studies in measurement in the data as well. And all the details, all our codes and data for the AER paper are posted on the AER website as well as my research page. Now, let me talk about the, our numerical uh, algorithm and the one reason, as mentioned earlier, that, that this line of work and took the multiple years to start to bear fruit is that uh, we had to work out the um, whole set of machinery uh, for, for, for this class of models. And we ended up using a uh, globally nonlinear projection algorithm with the parameterized expect expectations. So it turns out the globally nonlinear algorithm is critical for solving the search model because log linearization, uh, which is used quite often, is a popular method using Dynair. And uh, there, are, there are actually many papers in the existing literature. You embed the search model in a median scale DSG model, and, uh, and you do linearization. You look at the deterministic steady state, and you report all the quantitative moments. We argue is that maybe we should uh, um, it, it will help if we try to be, try to be a bit more careful 
computationally because block linearization understates the mean and the volatility of unemployment rate at the same time overstates the volatility of labor market tightness. And uh, here is some quantitative results by using Hector Monosky uh, model as as, uh, as the benchmark, and I should um, I should um, let me emphasize that uh, so our replication should not be interpreted as a critique on their work at all at all on the contrary, and we are complimenting uh, on their on their on their on their insightful work. If anything, our replication actually reinforces their thesis in the sense that this, this is what they report. So they solve the model and the weekly calibration, uh, um, uh, uh, the standard search model with a little bit of a uh, uh, twist on the vacancy cost, but that's not important. Bottom line is that they use a high flow value of unemployment volatility, so 0.955, such that they managed to hit unemployment volatility, right? 14.5% per, per quarter, uh, but the ones we use the exact the same model, exactly the same parameter values, we just solve it more accurately using projection algorithm. It turns out that their calibration actually delivers 25.7%. In other words, we end up helping them, reinforcing their uh, basic uh, conclusion. What we are saying is that you do not need the B value of 0.955. So that's why, that's why we ended up using 0.85 to achieve uh, that uh, the reasonable match between model and data moments. Okay, so it turns out that in in the original paper they actually implemented the nonlinear uh, method, but uh, there are some differences, especially in the di in discrete state space implementation. And uh, and I believe our method method is more accurate. Uh, their nonlinear method turns out to be quite close to log linearization. All right, so here is an um, uh, illustrative sample path. So nonlinearity in the search model shows up in two ways, both downside and upside. In the downside, the log linearization is going to miss all kinds of unemployment rate spikes. Okay, in bad times, the projection unemployment rate spikes up big time, big time, but the log linearization is going to miss that. On the other hand, in good times, because of uh, the Q externality, because of uh, matching and searching externality. Uh, firms are competing among themselves. The vacancy filling rate goes goes to zero, so uh, marginal cost of hiring uh, rise up pretty fast. So um, gradually, so economic booms are more gradual. Unemployment rate in projection code is not going to drop as fast as that in the log linearization. So as a result, the labor market tightness, which is vacancy divided by unemployment, is going to be exaggerated in log linearization. Well, as in projection, it's more it's accurate, not the more accurate. It is it is accurate. All right. So this is a uh, in uh, in in one million month simulation. So you can see the unemployment rate shows up. Left tail is not the tail anymore. It's basically it's the body. All right. So it's not the uh, is not uh, uh, this is the body of the dog. It's not just the tail. Uh, so unemployment rates shows up um, big time in recessions, while as you missed all that action uh, using log linearization. On the other hand, uh, using labor market tightness. So in the Hector Monosky model, the, the baseline model, there's only one state variable. So it turns out the theta is a one-to-one -one function against the log 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 productivity and we accurately capture that using uh, using projection whereas if you end up using log linearization you uh, you 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 end up with um, um, overblown labor market tightness and and its volatility as well okay all right, so let me pull everything together and uh, both in the AER paper and in our quantitative economics paper uh, we reported many more results uh, uh, for the for the indulged disaster paper, we looked at the home production, leisure, uh, capital extension, recursive uh, utility, but not the recursive utility and the capital together because we couldn't. Uh, we solved the simpler version of the model, but the equity premium is so down low, so we had to compromise. And uh, and in the quantitative economics paper, we worked out the version with the capital as well. And uh, there, are, there, are many, there are many results reported in the paper. Now, let me pull all the 
ingredients together. So I think after 10 years, we, I believe we have finally figured out what, I, what are the essential ingredients that one need um, to, to, to construct a unified model for asset prices and business cycles. And, uh, and the essential ingredients are recursive utility, search frictions, and capital accumulation. All right? And we calibrate the model to the consumption volatility in the Jordan and the co-author uh, macro history database. And uh, the model yields an equity premium of 4.3% quite close to, to, the, uh, to, to the empirical estimate and uh, relatively low average interest rate. And more importantly, we have a high stock market volatility, uh, tail point the 4%. And this is, um, you know, why as the, um, this is actually a common weakness uh, in the prior attempts of G DSG production economy, it's just the stock market volatility, which is only a one third to one half of what we have here. So actually more, more towards one third than one half. This is quite low, uh, while as the search economy mitigates that weakness substantially. Uh, we also show strong time series predictability for stock market excess returns, as well as for stock market volatility and weak to no predictability for consumption growth. And this is all because of uh, capital investment. So investment not only raises the hurdle for equity premium, but the investment actually helps the model to match uh, a lot of the status facts in aggregate asset pricing as well. So wage inertia uh, plays a big role in our setting. We, uh, for this paper, we did a little bit more clear metrics. In other words, economic history, we put together a long historical uh, sample on US wage rates and we estimate the wage elasticity to labor productivity to be uh, 0.27. And, uh, and in, in our model, we have something quite close. So uh, also important, risk aversion strongly affects quantity dynamics. In other words, the Pellerini separation proposition breaks down um, uh, in a more realistic setting. So it's, it's important to study prices and quantities together. And finally, welfare cost is huge, 33.6%, 30, and it's strongly countercyclical uh, in a model with realistic equity premium. All right. so. Um, um, skeletons of the model. Uh, again, lots of technical details. I'll leave you to the paper to read the paper if you are interested. So uh, basically, we have recursive utility. Uh, we have a CES production function. We started out doing Cobb Douglas and then couldn't close the deal for a long, long time. It was stuck for at least two years. And then uh, in the current paper, we reported that it's not a mathematical theorem or anything, uh, but, uh, but it's more like uh, lots of uh, uh, hints, quantitative results that uh, point to the direction that the CES production function is really, I wouldn't say indispensable, but probably uh, indispensable uh, for the equity premium to show up. And uh, and uh, for for example, it generates uh, counter cyclical labor share. Okay, and that the matching function is the same as before. Employment. Um, uh, accumulation, same as before, the unit uh, vacancy cost, also same as before. And finally, we use Urban Yearman's formulation uh, for the capital installation function. This is our modeling for adjustment costs. So um, uh, because this formulation is extremely convenient, uh, because at the aggregate level, investment is never negative. And this formulation will guarantee that because the marginal benefit of investment will go to infinity when investment goes to zero from the positive region. So which is very, very convenient. Wages from a Nash bargaining, now instead of just exogenous labor productivity, so we have labor productivity given in this form, which is in turn depend, which in turn depends on capital. And we need to subtract investment from dividends. Finally, labor market is clear from a goods market clear. So we calibrate the model to match the consumption volatility um, uh, in the in the Jordan and co-author macro history uh, data set. Unemployment rate is 9.4%. And more importantly, equity premium is 4.3%, uh, reasonably close to that in the data. And uh, stock market volatility is 12.4%, although still uh, somewhat lower than that in the data, but this is uh, this is a uh, you know two to three times larger than 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 prior studies uh, have been able to generate. 
Now, let me talk about the intuition. So early on, I mentioned, uh, highlighted the, uh, the, important, the importance of wage inertia and this uh, impulse response function really highlight uh, the internal mechanism. So because the model is highly nonlinear, impulse response are gonna depend on the initial conditions. So we have, we, so let's just focus on the bad economy, which is 10, 10th percentile of the model stationary distribution of aggregate productivity, capital, as well as employment. So this is the broken red line. So in the presence of one standard deviation negative shock on total factor productivity, output will drop by about 3.7%, but let's look at the wages. Wages hardly move at all. If anything, it remains constant for the first two years and they only slowly, gradually, gradually decline. Whereas the, in the median economy, wages will drop kind of right away, but not by a whole lot, you know, minus uh, only drop by 0.4%, which is order of magnitude smaller, their output uh, decline. So why would the wages remain constant in bad times? The reason is really the um, unit, the cost of vacancy posting because it depends on vacancy filling rate and the Q, the Q rate is counter cyclical. Okay, and that counter cyclical force in the unit cost of vacancy posting is gonna reinforce wage inertia precisely in bad times, <laughs> precisely in bad times. And this is our source of uh, time varying risk premium. Um, right, so and because wages are relatively uh, constant in bad times, profits are gonna drop more and look at dividends. This is dividends. Dividends are gonna be dropping by a whopping 17.7%. Okay, all these are in percentages. So in other words, output drops by 3.7%, dividends will drop by 17.7%. So this is our source of equity premium. And you can also see the time variation in the dividend risk as well. And everything is endogenous. So, um, so, so these are the heat maps for the key model moments to study the time variation um, of, of the key moments. So the left panel is price to consumption ratio plotted against aggregate productivity, total factor productivity. You can see that price to valuation ratio is clearly pro-cyclical, whereas risk premium, this equity risk premium is clearly counter-cyclical because of the wage inertia and the impulse, non-linear impulse response. And um, because you know in bad times, uh, risk gets blown up. Uh, blown up quite quite drastically. So stock market volatility as well, kind of cyclical, but they look at expected consumption growth. It's largely acyclical, okay? Uh, in simulations, uh, we, we overstate the predictability a little bit, but not by much, okay? So relative to a, um, to a model without capital investment, this is much better. Uh, this model performs much better. In other words, capital investment actually helps the model to eliminate the predictability in consumption growth. Okay? And this channel is reminiscent of Bob Hall's famous 1978 JP paper uh, in which he argues for the first time that the Martin, uh, consumption follows a martingale. So, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but he's right, he's right, he's right. And uh, we replicate his mechanism. Um, uh, this is, a, this is a, a set of results that at the first glance was actually quite counterintuitive and which turns out to be correct after all and which is, which is fun to work out all the implications. So in the model, we calibrate the labor sharing output uh, to be 74.6% following a 2002 JPE paper by Golan and, uh, and on top of that, which is not surprising that the labor share is counter cyclical. So that we're only calibrate the average 74.6. So basically labor share is wages, wage rate times employment divided by output, okay? Because of wage inertia labor market frictions, labor share is counter cyclical. So it goes up in bad times and uh, remains at the 74.6%. So before working out before working on this model, and my, my intuition was that, okay, so if labor share is 75, capital share in output is 25, that means roughly speaking, so labor ought to be more important than capital in the 
stock market valuation, right? It turns out that the intuition was wrong. It turns out in this model, capital share in market value is as high as 92.6%. So most of the time, so 92.6% uh, in better times, it goes to 100%. <laughs> it goes to 100%. Uh, when you think a little bit about it, and this is, this makes total sense. Because again, so wages are mostly expenses. They are ex wages are expensed away from earnings that do not enter the stock market valuation. So only vacancy costs are investment in workers. They and they, so the investment right in workers enter the stock market valuation. So, so only vacancy costs are investment. They can accumulate the capital, right? So in a sense, human capital, I'm gonna abuse the uh, terminology a little bit. So only that part, but that part is small, only slightly over uh, 7%. In fact, in extreme bad times, that the labor share in market value goes to zero with some very small probability that labor share is only is, is even negative. You know, imagine you are United Airlines or Delta Airlines, you know, in the darkest days of the COVID crisis and nobody was flying and you have to pay the uh, high wages and the maintenance and all. And then uh, you, at that point, uh, the, the, the marginal value of a worker is really close to zero and probably even negative. You would like to uh, lay off some workers, but for whatever reasons you cannot. So this makes sense. Even though shadow value with some small probability for labor is negative, but overall stock market is still positive. So firms do not exit, but this is something uh, um, uh, seemingly contradictory results actually fit together quite harmoniously uh, within a structural model. So I thought it was fun to think about. So finally, welfare cost is on average pretty high and they strongly counter cyclical. This is a, uh, a scatter plot against the total factor productivity. The right panel is against unemployment. So business cycle analysis is clearly important. Uh, studying optimal policies is clearly important. Right, so finally, let me conclude. So towards the theory of everything. So we feel, we feel that after 10 years of effort, we feel that we are finally uh, figured out what are the essential ingredients that we need uh, to put the unified model together. Um, so, and these ingredients include recursive utility, search frictions, as well as capital investment. Thank you.